what we're here to do today is to ask you some questions. I'm not here pushing a program. We already have enough counties to make a state. We already have enough jurisdiction. We already have enough standing in court to create a state. We already have all that. We have 13, 14 counties in California. Several more are going to join pretty quickly. Um, we have active organizations in 23 counties. What I'm here to do is ask you a question. Are you ready to think for the next 50 generations? Are you ready to secure liberty for your children? Would everybody under 30 stand up? Well, I see those kids, they don't have to stand up. <laughs> you know, we were given a job. And, and by the way, I want to preface that by saying, I can prove every single thing I'm going to say to you today. I can prove it in a document I have right in front of me. I can prove it with a document I have in that bag that my wife calls the MERS. Or I can prove it with a document that's in my computer. And if I can't prove it with one of those things, I can prove it with a document I can pull up. I can show you in 10,000 speeches, 10,000 letters, 10,000 documents, why the things I'm going to say to you are true. There is no doubt about the truth. And one of the questions we have to settle today in our own minds is, are we going to believe the truth or are we going to believe the lie? My brother just passed away a couple of years ago, but he used to say this all the time. And it comes from the Bible. Truth cannot have fellowship with darkness. Where there's darkness, there is no light. And where there is light, darkness cannot exist. And that's the same with the truth and the lie. So we have to figure out what's the truth and what's the lie here, and whether we want to join the liars or start telling the truth, even when it costs us money, or in the words of our founders, it, it secures liberty with the lives, the treasure, and the sacred honor of our fathers. You see, liberty was a gift to you. You didn't pay for it. I didn't pay for my liberty. I'm a veteran, a Vietnam combat veteran. I didn't pay for my liberty. My fathers and forefathers paid for it with their lives, their treasure, and their sacred honor. And I can prove that. It's the last paragraph in the Declaration of Independence that tells us that. And with their lives, their treasure, and their sacred honor, the formerly 13 colonies formed 13 sovereign states equal in sovereignty with any nation in the world. That's in the last paragraph. That is a proof. So is this the law of the land or isn't it? Is the Constitution the truth or is it a lie? Because it, it has to be one or it has to be the other. There is no gray here. Now these states were so sovereign that they were equal to any nation in the world. <laughs> equal on the world stage in that sovereignty. And they demonstrated that because the states of the United States were sovereign nations for 10 years during the prosecution of the Revolutionary War. There was no common government. There was a constitutional convention. They tried to settle things. They tried to get states to contribute to the war effort, and most of them did, a lot of them did. Uh, not the majority of the people did not. It was a vast minority of the people that prosecuted the Revolutionary War. They gained support as they went on. But for 10 years, the original 13 states were sovereign, equal to any nation in the world. And at that point, they formed a government. And here's another important thing. There are four things we're going to talk about today. First of all, we're going to talk about jurisdiction. Jurisdiction is very important. I'm a reserve deputy sheriff in Siskiyou County. I am not anti-law, not anti-government, never was, never will be. But I am for liberty, and I am for constitution. A famous constitutional scholar once said, if you can't define liberty, how can you defend it? And if you can't define tyranny, how can you defeat it? That's the case here. We need to be able to define liberty and define tyranny to find out what it is we're trying to protect and how we can protect it. And in order to do that, we have to realize and understand why we have a constitution to start with. Who cares? Why do we have a constitution in the United States? Why do we have a state constitution? What is that document designed to do? What does it say? And is it doing those jobs? Those are the important questions to determine because we need to have legal jurisdiction to do what we're doing, and we do that. In fact, Article 4, Section 3 of the United States Constitution gives us the primary jurisdiction to create a new state. 
The founding fathers saw the need for it to, to add new states to the Union or to allow the separation of territory from existing states to form a state. And it's been done four times in our history. We are not making up law. We're not trying to do something that can't be done, shouldn't be done, and has never been done before. This has been done four times in our history. Maine separated from Massachusetts. You know why they did it? Because their representation was so far away from their homes that they did not feel they were represented. And it took them three tries to vote their way out of Massachusetts. Uh, Vermont separated from New York. Now, Vermont is right next to New York. But they felt that the cultural, historical, moral, and economic values of the state of New York did not represent Vermonters. So they separated from New York. West Virginia separated from Virginia for obvious reasons. It was 1861. They did not think that the government of Virginia represented their values. It wasn't because one party was in charge or another party was in charge, quite frankly, even though in 1861 that was most decidedly the Democrats that were in favor of slavery and, and so on, and Republicans were in favor of abolition. But that had nothing to do with that. What it had to do with was the West Virginia felt the government of Virginia no longer represented the needs of their people, and so they separated. Tennessee separated for Virginia much earlier than that because Virginia was so far away, the Virginia Burgesses did not represent the values of the people in Tennessee, so they separated. That's an Article 4, Section 3 state split. There is a lot of case law in order to help us do what we're doing. But in order to, to get to that point, first we have to figure out why we have a constitution to begin with. In other words, if we have a constitution now, how will a new constitution help us live better lives? How will another constitution get us where we need to be? There are two principles that the court adheres to in contract law. One is called the meeting of the minds. When you have a contract, and let's face it, a constitution is nothing more than a social compact, a contract. In fact, the Oregon Constitution calls it a social compact. And when you have a contract, that contract must be interpreted. Because remember, this was not a land empty of people with a government sitting there waiting to subjugate you. This was a country that was empty, and when people came, they formed a government. The King of England, the first King of England, was not placed upon his throne by God himself. He was elected by the people, and not all the people, but at least the people that had money. That was the beginning of a republic. And well, that's true, and, 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 and a thousand or so years ago, they thought quite differently than we did. But at any rate, the king was placed on that throne by the nobles and barons. Why did they need him? Why did they care? They needed a single voice to help protect them from invasions from across the English Channel. And they needed a single voice to, to conduct trade agreements. They needed a single voice to conduct peace agreements. Because obviously, the state of Jefferson would not be prepared to conduct a war with China, right? We need all 51 states in order to do that. The state of Jefferson during World War II could not have gone out and concluded a peace treaty with the Japanese. That would have been stupid and it wouldn't have worked. We needed all 50 states to do that. So there are times in, in people's lives that they need government. And what government is designed to do is to secure the liberty you hold most dear. And I'm going to prove that in a second. So why do we have a constitution? Who cares? Well, the United States Constitution has that in meeting of the minds, and that means you go back to what the original authors of the document said. And we can do that. We have all their notes, all their papers, all their letters. We've looked in their dresser drawers. We, we know where they slept. We've looked under the bed in a couple of places. We know exactly what our founders thought, exactly what they said. The Federalist Papers, the Anti-Federalist Papers, the Kentucky Resolutions, the Virginia Declaration, I could go on and on and on. So why do we have Constitution in the United States? We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union. A more perfect union, what an odd thing to say. Why wouldn't they just say, we have a Constitution in order to form a union, in order to combine, to have one voice? Why wouldn't you say that? Well, the answer to that is simple. When you go back to the, the oldest evidence rule, that's another rule in contract law, 
where if you want to interpret a contract, you look at the oldest evidence available. That would be the original notes and papers of the people who wrote the document. And if you could talk to the originators of the contract so that they could tell you exactly what they intended the contract to do. And the oldest records are available to us, both in Oregon and California and the United States. So when we go back to the meeting of the minds, we look and say, we the people in the United States in order to form a more perfect union. We had a union before. We had the Articles of Confederation. We had 10 presidents before George Washington. They weren't presidents of the United States, they were presidents of the Congress. They were called President of the Congress. And that form of government did not serve the people. And so what they did was they came to a constitutional convention and they abolished that form of government and they formed a new government more suited to their ends. That's in the Constitution and it's in the Declaration of Independence. That is our permission and our jurisdiction in order to form a government that is more suitable to the common good or the public good. Now, when they formed that Constitution, they broke the law because the Art Articles of Confederation had a very important clause in them. And it said, no one will change these articles unless the states give them permission to do it. In fact, when the Constitutional Convention was set up, several states left because the first item discussed was the Virginia Plan. We want to scrap the whole document. We want to throw the articles away and form a constitution. And that some of the delegates were so upset, the delegates from New York in particular, they said, we don't have the jurisdiction or the authority from our state to do that. We're out of here, boys. I mean, whatever you do, you're breaking the law and we don't want any part of it. So how did they have the jurisdiction to do that? And this is also in the Declaration of Independence. All just political power is derived from the people. Right? I answered questions for a Shasta County supervisor for five hours in a Denny's one time. And at the end, he was so mad, spit was coming out of his mouth when he was talking to me. And he said, finally, what gives you, the individual, not, not me, the organization, what gives you the right to sit here and tell me that you have the jurisdiction to form a new state? I said, well, gosh, that's the easiest question you ask me all day. We the people. Right? Because people created government. People authored the Declaration of Independence. We didn't even have states then. The people authored that document. People created government. The states and the people created the entity we call the federal government. The contract we call Constitution resulted in an entity called the federal government. The Constitution you call the Constitution of Oregon resulted in the entity you refer to as state government. That is the result of the contract. It is not the arbiter of the contract. Have you ever in your lives heard of a contract where the contract itself gets to tell the people who wrote it what to do later? And those provisions are not in the original contract. Have you ever read a contract where the product of the contract has the absolute authority to change the rules in the contract after it was signed. I've never heard of such a thing, and I'm a cop. I've never heard of such a thing. And I've sat in on thousands of trials as a bailiff. Contract law, criminal law, civil law, whatever, administrative law. I have never once heard of a contract with the ability to change itself in spite of the people who created that contract. Why do you have a contract in, or why do you have a constitution in Oregon? Why do you need that? Let's go back to the meeting of the minds. This is the preamble of the Oregon State Constitution. This is why you have a constitution here. These are the people who created your contract telling you, future generations, why they created that contract. We, the people of the state of Oregon, to the end that justice be established, order maintained, and liberty perpetuated do ordain this Constitution. Why do you have a Constitution here? To perpetuate liberty, to establish justice, and maintain order. All things that government belongs in. 
Do you have a constitution here so you can get stuff? Do you have a constitution here so you can give stuff to people? I'm not necessarily against giving stuff to people, but is that constitutional? Is it constitutional to take stuff from someone so you can give that stuff to other people? Not according to this, it's not. You have a constitution in order to perpetuate liberty. In California, our constitution is based on Christian principles. I can prove it. I can prove it very easily. Here is the preamble to the California Constitution. We the people of the state of California, grateful to Almighty God for our freedom that to secure and perpetuate it, we establish this Constitution. We only have one reason, well, two reasons. We have two reasons in California to have a Constitution, and that contract in all respects should follow those two reasons because the preamble is the very basis for that document. One, we're grateful to Almighty God. That's one principle. Two, what are we grateful for? Our freedom. To secure that freedom, we need a constitution. Now this is interesting. We're starting to get into some stuff here. Why do you need to secure your freedom in Oregon? Who do you need to secure it from? Uh, you weren't at war with anyone. In California, we had a war with the Mexicans. We won, the Mexican government was gone. They weren't a threat to us anymore. Why did we need to secure liberty from them? They were gone. They had no say in our affairs, didn't try, absolutely were, were out of our lives. Who are we trying to secure liberty from? What is the only other entity on the block that is big enough to take that freedom from you at that point in time, in 1850 or 1855? The federal government, right? So we're coming down to the next principle after jurisdiction. We have Article 4, Section 3. You also have Oregon Constitution, Section 1, Natural Rights Inherent in the People. Here is your jurisdiction to withdraw from the state of Oregon and join the state of Oregon should you choose to. Uh, we declare that all men, when they form a social compact, are equal in right, and that all power not some of it, not the part the government gives you, not the part they'd like you to have, not the part that the majority party will allow the minority party to have. All power is inherent in the people, and all free governments are founded on their, the people's authority, and instituted for their peace, safety, and happiness. And they have at all times, at all times, a right to alter, reform, or abolish the government in such manner as they may think proper. That is your primary jurisdiction, your constitutional jurisdiction in the state of Oregon to, to withdraw from Oregon and form the state of Jefferson with us. In our state, it's Article 2, Section 1 of the California Constitution. All just political powers inherent in the people and government is established for their good and they have the right to alter or reform government anytime the public good demands. What other jurisdiction do we have that's primary? We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among those, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Government is established among men to secure those rights and they have the right to alter or abolish it whenever the, whenever the people demand. I'm paraphrasing, whenever the good, public good demands it. That's in the Declaration of Independence. That was our first document. And by the way, this is a Christian nation. I can prove that too. I don't care if you're a Christian or not. I don't care if you like this or not. This is the truth, and this is why all these documents work. Do you know the first document we ever signed as a nation was the peace treaty between us and Great Britain. You know what the first line in it is? In the name of the holy and undivided trinity. If that isn't a Christian ideal, I don't know what is. But these morals and these values give strength and weight to our argument should you choose to stand for liberty, because you don't have to. You have inalienable rights. You have natural rights. You have what William Blackstone called absolute rights. William Blackstone was an interesting guy. He wrote two commentaries on law that were the main law books in every law school in the United States until about 10 years, 15 years into the progressive period, about 1928. 
at which point they were slowly removed from law schools. Those documents served our country since the middle 1700s, and in 1928 they were slowly phased out, and they're not curricula now. But William Blackstone said that you have absolute rights. They are rights that belong to you, given you by your creator, whether you participate in society or not. They're just yours. They're yours if you live in a hole on the side of the mountain. They're yours if you live in town. If you lived in a hole on the side of the mountain and you never saw anyone from government or anybody else ever again, you have the right to life. That is your gift from God, Christian principle. It is a gift from your creator. How can I prove that? All men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. That right is yours, that right to life. And also, naturally, wouldn't the defense of that life be your right? I mean, if you can't defend your life, what good is it? If I can take it any time I want, what good is your life? You have the right to liberty. You can think what you want, do what you want, say what you want. Now, in government, we delegate certain rights to government so that we can protect the rights we hold most dear. You can't yell fire in a crowded theater because you may cost your neighbor his life in the stampede. Well, you're not allowed to deprive your neighbor of his life just because you want to have your right to say what you want. So those liberties are balanced. What is that? That's freedom with morality, right? That's what liberty is, isn't it? Freedom with responsibility and morality. You are always responsible. You always have to think and consider, is the exercise of my inalienable right going to deprive someone else of theirs? That's got to be part of this equation, or we will never make it as a state. I demand this. If we are not honorable, if we don't have the highest degree of integrity it is possible for a human being to have, we should not create this state because we will just be swapping one master for another in the end. It is very important. If we cannot hold these constitutional ideals most dear, I don't want to win because this would not be a good end to our experiment. So, once we determine the, the uh, absolute rights, which William Blackstone said you enjoy at all times, property is another one. In other words, if you lived in your hole and you had some rocks and you used those to pound out animal skin or smash potatoes or whatever, how would it work if somebody came and stole your rocks every day? You'd have a hard time making it. So you have the right to property. Is it any different if you came home to your hole and there was a sign in front of it that said, Rocks are very precious to society, and you may not use those on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. You may not travel your path to the river because you're stepping on endangered plants, even though that water means a right to life to you, because you will die without the water. Is there any different if government came into your kitchen and said, you know, we're an awful big stressor on the environment, and it's really because people eat too much. So we're going to take a third of your food out of the pantry. Oh, and by the way, you're not going to be allowed to use the rest of it except when we tell you to, but you can get a permit. Don't worry, it'll be easy, and it won't cost much this year. <laughs> Is there any difference in that or telling a guy who has a forested piece of property that he may not engage in healthy stands management? What is money, right? Or for me, I'm, I'm a rancher as well. It is no different when the government tells me that I cannot use my 150-year-old water right to water the grass because grass gets eaten by the cow and the cow gains weight and weights money. It's no different than, him, than the government coming to your house and taking food out of your pantry. It's a longer process, but it's no different. So you have the nail rights to life, liberty, and property, and then Samuel Adams added to that, and he said, together with the means to defend those as best we can. John Locke called them the natural rights. Marcus Cicero said that some rights are not written on paper. They're, they're derived from nature itself. They're written in the hearts of men. They require no training. We know these things by nature, and what he meant was nature's God. In the old days when they said nature, they meant God. So we have those rights, but how can we secure them against a government who would take those anytime they want to? The answer to that is to form a government that holds those ideals most dear and will protect those for hundreds of years through a constitution that cannot be easily changed. 
and guarantees those liberties to all of its people, no matter who they are. The difference between democracy and constitutional republic is an interesting thing. And in 1825, Alex de Tocqueville was sent to America from France, and Alex was a, a French nobleman. Somehow he escaped the guillotine. Uh, I don't know how, but somehow he did. And he was sent to America to find out one thing. Why does constitutional republic work and democracy not work? Why is it that democracy doesn't work? Because it was an utter failure in France. They literally legalized murder and thousands of people lost their heads to the guillotine because the majority, 50% plus one, was mad at a group of people and they decided we can murder these people and there's no consequence for it because we're the majority, right? So Alex came to America and he rode his horse around for five years trying to determine why constitutional republic works. And you know what he said? He said, the greatest form of government known to man is the township or the county because local decisions are made locally by people who have empathy for how your lives are conducted. And on top of that, if you are unsatisfied with the way a local representative is doing his job, it doesn't cost 50 million bucks to get rid of the guy and elect somebody better. In other words, representation in smaller districts works where representation that is so broad that no one has empathy for the way you live doesn't work. I don't care what your issue is. I don't even know. I mean, I know what the issues are in California. I know what some of the issues are here because I live right across the board. But your separate issues are yours. I don't care whether you're a Democrat or a Republican. I really don't. I'm not a member of either of those parties. Both of them kind of make me mad. So. But I am a constitutionalist. I will vote for whatever person stands in front of the room and says, I'll follow this document to the letter. He's got my vote just on that. Amen. If he does a lousy job in other areas, we'll have that conversation another time. Well, our problem is that we have, in California, we have the worst representative ratio in the nation. And it's 400% worse than state number 49. We have a state senator that represents 11 counties. And when you call him and ask him for something, he says, well, Gosh, you know, I represent an awful lot of people, and your county's pretty small, and well, I'll see what I can do, and you never hear from them again. In fact, in our state, it's so bad, if everybody in his district only called him once a year, he'd have to answer the phone 6,200 times every day, and he'd be able to spend 2.9 seconds with each caller. That's not representation. And it is not representation when a government 500 miles away from here tells you how to live because they don't know you, and they don't know what it takes to live your life, and once again, I don't care what your issues are, they can't know what they are. We want to form a state where each county, each and every county, has equal representation in the state senate. Now, the state's constitutional convention will decide whether that's one or two or three each, I don't care, but each county will have equal representation in the senate, and no county will be so small that they are rounded down till they don't have representatives in the assembly. In other words, the federal model of government. In the federal model of government, every state has two senators, and no state, no state, no matter how small, has less than one member of Congress. In California, we have the federal model of government. We had it from 1879 all the way until 1964. And you know what? California worked until then. We had less than $5 billion in debt, and believe me, the Republicans weren't always in charge. Sometimes the Democrats were, but here was the deal. Rural counties were intended, in the 1879 convention, rural counties were intended to control the Senate. Because even in 1879, when big towns had 10,000 people in them, the framers of our Constitution realized that at some point, urban majorities will exceed rural majorities, and at that very moment, cities will run the state regardless of what anybody else wants or needs. But we had that model of government until 1964, and here's what happened. There were a, a three Supreme Court cases. The first one, this part's kind of boring, folks, but it's very important because we're moving from uh, jurisdiction to sovereignty and sovereignty to interposition and to the best part, nullification. So we have to establish our sovereignty first. So in California, we had a federal model 
where every county had one state senator. In fact, there was a proposition in 1926, Prop 28, where the California Farm Bureau Federation codified that. Now, in the 1879 convention, we had one for each county because we only had 40 counties. But in 1879, they capped the Senate at uh, 40 senators. And you know why they did that? Because they, they wanted to get rid of all the Chinese people. In fact, Article 19 of the 1879 convention said it's a felony to hire a Chinese person. So California state legislature wanted to make sure that Chinese people never have representation, and that's why they capped it at 80 or at 40 senators. But in 1926, they saw that as we gained population, we got more counties, that representation was being diminished in the rural areas, and by then people had grown a brain, and they'd gotten rid of that, get rid of the Chinese thing, and they decided to pass Prop 26, which roughly gave each, it's too long a story, I'm not gonna bore you with it, but what they did was they gave each county roughly a state senator. Now, smaller counties had to share, uh, but it was no more than three counties and they had to be contiguous, which isn't too bad. I mean, Alpine County has like 2,000 people in it. And that Prop 28 survived five popular challenges, five. By a vast majority of the voters of California, they realized that, that compromise was the best way. Rural areas controlled the Senate, cities controlled the Assembly, but the result of that was compromise. People had to talk to one another. They had to come to solutions that weren't weighted one way or the other. And it worked. It worked because nobody got everything they wanted, but everybody got something they needed. So in 1962, Chief Justice Earl Warren, who Dwight Eisenhower called the worst damn fool mistake he ever made, decided in a Tennessee case, a Tennessee or Kentucky case, that the court had, the, in fact, it was then, that the Supreme Court of the United States gave itself the power to intervene in state elections. I have read this thing a thousand times. The Supreme Court have it, having jurisdiction over state affairs is nowhere in it. In fact, Article 3 that create the court, creates the court, Section 2 says that the court has jurisdiction over all matters of equity and law under the Constitution. All matters of equity and law that are constitutional. It does not have the authority and never did have the authority to alter the document that created it. It does not have that authority. So the court gave itself the authority to intervene in state elections in Baker versus Carr. In Gray versus Sanders, a couple of years later, the court said, and this was a county block voting case, a lot of states um, most of the states that had the federal model of government, and there were over 30 of them, by the way, that had one state senator for each county, voted in what they called county block. In other words, people in the county, one man, one vote, they all voted, but they voted for the senator in their county. And the court, since it had given itself the power to intervene, said no, no. All, all state elections will be one man, one vote. All state elections. Well, Earl Warren thought that was the end of it. But 30 court challenges later came Reynolds versus Sims. And here's where Warren got a little bit mad and he put a nail in the box. He said, all right, all right, I've had enough of this. All state elections will be conducted by apportionment schemes supervised by the court. And changed, the apportionment schemes will be changed every 10 years with the census. And that apportionment districts must be roughly equal in population. And there is a small ratio that's allowed, 7%, 10%, something like that, but it's very small. And so when Warren retired, someone asked him, what are you most proud of in your career? And he said, I caused, and he didn't say civil rights, he didn't say desegregation. He said, I caused 30 state legislatures to change the way they elected state officers. In other words, he changed the Constitution without the benefit of the amendment process and gave himself the power to end state sovereignty because the court determines whether a state election is fair or not the people of the state. And on we go from there. So that was the end of state sovereignty. However, we're pretty lucky because you should be asking yourself now, if Warren said you can't have a state senator for each county, if the court said that, the king, you know, and you're subject to the king if you're subject to the court, right? Why can you form a state of Jefferson where every county has a state senator? That's not legal. It's not that one guy screaming at me. It's not the law of the land. 
But anyway, we can do it because of a case that was 20 years after Reynolds, and it's called Brown versus Thompson. And in Brown versus Thompson, it was held that Wyoming had not violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Here it is right here. In, in that they allowed Niobra County, a very small county with only 3,000 people, to retain a state representative in spite of the fact that that ratio was very dramatically different from more populous counties in Wyoming. And the League of Women Voters said they don't deserve a state representative because it will dilute the vote of the cities. But the court found with Niobra, and here's why. The majority justice said, the opportunity for oppression of the people of this state, or any of them, is greater if any county is deprived of representative in the legislature than if each is guaranteed at least one representative. So the court in Brown versus Thompson gives us permission, and there's another caveat, it must serve legitimate state policy, and it must be free from the taint of discrimination. I'm a retired 747 captain. I've flown all over the world. I have friends in 100 countries, and they're, they're probably more, my friends have probably more colors than the colors I can see in this room. I will not be part of this if it has anything to do with discriminatory practices. That's not how I'm wired. What I want, what I want is adequate representation for people who have none now. I want adequate representation because also, in a case, Sailor versus Two-Layer Water, the court reversed itself again and said, no, it's true, votes cannot represent rocks and trees, but votes do represent communities, and communities have diverse needs. I mean, we have live in a forested county. Our needs are far different than Mojave County or counties in eastern Oregon that are desert counties. We have catastrophic wildfire that happens all the time. A lot of those counties don't. We need different things, and we need representation in order to have a hope of getting those things. And that's what Jefferson's about. I don't care about agendas. I don't care about any particular item that you might be thinking about, the weed or the water or any of it. I care about representation. And with that representation, your community can decide how it wants to live. The state of Jefferson that we envision the lion's share of the power will reside with the county. Your county commissioners will have the power to decide local issues locally. And in fact, we want to ensure state sovereignty in one easy way. We're going to suck the money out of it. When you pay your property taxes, you will pay them to Josephine County. Josephine County will then in turn send that portion of the state budget to the state. The state will not be able to use your own money to hit you over the head with because they don't think you're behaving the way they want you to. Because they're never going to have your money to start with. They're going to have the part they need to live on, 12% or 14% or whatever it works out to. We are going to engineer a situation where the federal government will not be able to violate state sovereignty. When you pay your federal income tax, you will pay it to a holding account payable to the, for the federal government to the state of Jefferson. And the state of Jefferson will pay that to the federal government, provided the federal government is not acting intrusively into the affairs of our state. They will not have our money to stop it. In other words, they will not be able to beat you to death with your own money because they're never going to have it if they do that. And if we take that even further, what are the powers that we delegated to the federal government in order to protect the liberty we hold most dear? Article 1, Section 8. That enumerates very specifically the powers of the federal government. Those are the only powers constitutionally that they have with some very vague exceptions with inter for interstate commerce and, and uh, general welfare clause. But those are very vague exceptions. Their powers are strictly enumerated in order to protect the liberty we hold most dear. And so, if we wanted to, in the state of Jefferson, and this is up to the Constitutional Convention, I'm not the king of Jefferson, you people will help decide that should you choose to join us. We can literally hold them to the letter of the document that created them. How will we keep the Forest Service out? How will we keep BLM out? The feds are still the feds, right? This is a question I hear all the time. Just because you have a state doesn't mean the feds aren't gonna come in and take all your stuff. Well, yes, it does. 
because the Ninth and Tenth Amendment are very powerful tools. Now we're coming to the good part, interposition and state nullification. What is interposition? Interposition is an entity that stands between you and the wolves so that you don't have to fight these fights on a personal level every single day. Aren't you tired? My rear end is an inch off the ground and the bucket is dry. Every time we compromise with those people, I give them something. I have never had a compromise yet where they gave me something back. So we have in the, the principle of interposition. What is interposition? Interposition on behalf of the federal government means federal armies, federal militias, federal programs, and federal doctrines prevent other countries from coming and taking your stuff. Right? That's, that's all it is. That's what Article 1, Section 8 does. That's what the Ninth and Tenth Amendment does. What happens when the federal government turns around and wants to take your stuff? The state interposes. The state's job, what, was your, what did your preamble say again? Secure liberty, right? The state's job is to face the federal government and say, no, Article 1, Section 8 says you can't do that. The Ninth and Tenth Amendment say you can't do that. And by the way, I am one of the authors of the Constitution of the United States, and I have the power to tell the product of that creation how they will and will not behave toward my sovereign entity, the state. That's what, that's what interposition is. Now, what happens when the state says, to, when the federal government says to the state, hey, if you don't help us take their stuff, we're not going to give you a bunch of money for roads. Now, all of a sudden, the state turns around and they're standing right next to the federal government saying, we're coming to get your stuff. Who interposes then? The sheriff. He's the, he's the last guy in the room standing that has the constitutional authority to take the badge and gun off a Fed. And I am a sheriff. I know this is true. Federal agencies operate by memorandum of, of understanding. Because of state sovereignty, they don't have the power to come here unrestricted and take your stuff. The sheriff can strip them of that power. He cannot strip a state agent because state agents have general law enforcement power throughout the state, but he can strip a Fed. Sheriff DiAgostini in Del El Dorado County took the badges and guns off of U.S. Forest Service not like their behavior towards the people who elected them to stand between you and the wolves who elected him. He took their badges and guns away, and guess what? It stuck, because he has the constitutional authority to do that. All right, now what happens when the state says to the sheriff, hey, if you don't help me take their stuff, I'm not going to give you the money for the half track and the body armor and stuff that you want. Now you have the sheriff standing next to the state, next to the feds. Who's interposing now? The last concept here, folks, and this is where we are today. There is a contract law provision called self-help. If provisions of the contract will not or cannot be honored, you are free to seek self-help. Why are you free? All powers inherent in the people. California Constitution Article 2, Section 1. Oregon Constitution, Section 1. All power belongs to the people. They have the right to alter government or abolish it. That's self-help. So, how do we get there from here? We created a process, and we, we pulled this out of the air, never having broken a state in half before. I'm sure mistakes were made. But we created a process called the Declaration and Petition to withdraw from the state due to lack of representation and dilution of vote. We did this for a very specific reason. We need to create a principle called standing in court. We need to create a situation where there is harm. In other words, if we go and we ask the state for something that's legitimate, Section 1 of the Oregon Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution of the United States, Article 4, Section 3, we have the jurisdiction to ask for these things. Once we create a state, we'll have the sovereignty to protect them. But we have to create the state first. We created the principle of the Declaration. The Declaration in itself does nothing, nothing whatsoever. It doesn't cost your county anything. You don't have to do anything different. Your county doesn't have to spend one nickel. They will not be part of this except if they agree, if your county commission agrees to sign this Declaration, they will have a seat at the table 
when representation is discussed in Salem. That's all they get out of this. They don't have to do anything. Nobody's asking them for any money. You have to pay. You have to pay to make this a reality. Why is that? Because if you don't pay for it, you won't appreciate it. Right? If you give a kid a bicycle, it's out in the mud three days later. If he pays for it himself, he takes pretty good care of it. We don't want county government to pay for this. We're not asking them for any money. In fact, we specifically tell them, we don't want your money. We've raised 116,000 bucks in California to proceed with this lawsuit. And by the way, you are the beneficiaries of that because Article 4, Section 3 does not say what time you have to come to the table. We're, we're pretty far down the road in this deal. We're going to uh, submit legislation next month. We're going to file our, our case in court within three weeks if we're ignored by the state of California. But that doesn't hurt you, that helps you. Because as we establish that precedent, it creates an opening for you. And it increases the weight of the political argument, because that's what you need. You need weight in numbers. You need lots of people to be going for this, or the state's going to ignore you, and they can. And 50 people can't pay for a Supreme Court case. We're asking 10,000 people to give 100 bucks for the state of Jefferson. Now, it's not much, over 10,000 people. I mean, it's a lot of money for us, but we'll do it because liberty is worth that to me. Mm -hmm. But it's different than asking 100 people to give 10,000 each, right? Yeah. I mean, so what we need is we need tens of thousands of patriots. You know, it's the summer soldier and the sunshine patriot that shrinks from the service of his country. But those that stand with us now deserve the thanks of man and woman. Remember that? There's nothing new under the sun. History does not re itself because we make mistakes. History repeats itself because it does. Our opportunity is not to make the same mistake twice. And Ecclesiastes tells us what was will be and what has been done will be done. Nothing this government is trying to do right now to you is new. Thomas Gordon said in 1721, every plowman knows the difference between good government and bad. He knows whether his produce is his to keep or whether it will be taxed into insignificance. Sound familiar? That was 300 years ago. Nothing new. This declaration gives you standing. If your county commission signs it, you are now participants in the court case. The court case is lack of representation and dilution of vote because every county does not have a state senator. Reynolds versus Sims did one interesting thing. It locked in apportionment districts so that as decades go by, rural areas lose representation and places where population naturally grows the fastest gains representation. And that's what we're going to fight. We're not going to try to overturn Reynolds. Politically, that would probably be impossible. And believe me, the Supreme Court is political, if you haven't guessed already. But what we are going to say is the court chose the wrong remedy. Instead of fixing apportionment districts so that rural areas lose it as years go by, what they should have done was continuously expanded representation so every county has some. Yeah. Now in California, if we look at George Washington and we say what George said, one for 30,000 is democracy, one for 40,000 is tyranny. So let's say we got the court to go for what George says, and let's face it, he was there when they wrote that thing. He knows what he meant. We would have 1,365 assembly people in California and something like 900 senators. The Capitol building would explode under the weight of all of those egos. <laughs> so here's what we're hoping for. Every court case also has what they call a settlement conference, where the judge will say to the participants in the suit, look, in order to save a bunch of money and a bunch of time, y'all go in the back room and fight this out and see if you can come up with a better idea than this lawsuit. So if it looks like we have a good case, and believe me, we do, remember, state number 40 49, we're number 50, state number 49 and representative benchmarks is 400% better off than California's. We have a pretty good case, which you will share in the benefit of. If it looks like we're going to win, uh, we think the state of California will come to us and say, look, fellas, what can we do to make this go away? And we're going to say, well, that's easy, guys. Allow us to separate peacefully. We'll form a state with our constitutional republic, and you all can keep ripping your own people off till the cows come home. And we think they'll do that because the vast majority of political power lies in Los Angeles and South, 51% is 650 miles away from my house. So 
If we can create the state through one of those means, either legislation, because Article 4, Section 3 says, nor shall any state be formed from the territory of an existing state or adjoining states unless the state legislatures agree and Congress agrees. So we need a 50% plus one vote in the State House in Oregon, 50% plus one vote in the United States Congress, and the same in California. It's, you know, you guys might have a better shot than us, but it ain't bloody likely for us to get that vote, right? We're not kids here. The mono party will stop that and squash it in a heartbeat. So here's what we've done with that. We asked a question. That's very important in a federal challenge. You have to ask for something. If you didn't ask for something, you can't get it. We're asking for liberty through adequate representation. What if we get ignored? What if you go to Salem and say, look, you guys are just not good for us. We want to go with Jefferson. You think they're going to say, oh, yeah, here, let us sign up? They're probably going to ignore you, too. That creates harm. When a state that's supposed to represent you with a Republican form of government, as Article 4, Section 4 of the United States Constitution says, and you are denied that fair hearing, that's harm. Uh, let's, let's use a, a metaphor. If you go in an ice cream store and you buy an ice cream and as you walk out the door hits you in the rump and you drop your ice cream cone. You go back in and you tell the guy, your door made me drop my ice cream cone. I've been harmed. I want another ice cream cone. Well, here's the last part of the federal challenge. There has to be a remedy to the harm. If the guy looks at you and he honestly says, you know, buddy, I'm going out of business and you got the last ice cream I had, I'd gladly give you another one, but I just don't have any more. The court's going to say, I'm sorry, there's no remedy for the harm you've suffered, case dismissed. This is an easy one. What's the remedy for lack of representation? Separation. More representation, at the very least. At the very least, what we could gain is something that's very important. Representation for Josephine County at the state level. That's the worst thing that probably could happen to Well, the worst thing that could happen to us is nothing. And things won't change. But at the very least, if the court agrees in principle that rural counties are not represented and they go with jurisdicta, which is the Supreme Court is supposed to follow the most modern case that comes along, and they follow Brown versus Thompson and Saylor versus Two Letter Water, they will say, you know, you're right. Rural counties, communities deserve a vote. You deserve representation. And they will expand representation in Oregon so that you get some. That's the worst thing that could happen. The best thing, and what I hope and dream for, is separation. Because then we can form a state that has a constitutional republic that respects the rights of the individual, respects the rights to property, and your ability to use that property to benefit yourself and your children, to make a living for yourselves and your family. And if we create our constitution correctly, if we do this right, the way the founders imagined, we will cast that document in granite and it will be difficult enough to change that it would be a hundred years before some creative load of politicians could figure out a way around it. And, and, and at that point, it will be someone else's job to secure liberty for their posterity. Because as I said before, your liberty was free. You didn't pay for it. It was paid for by your fathers and your grandfathers and our forefathers. But it did have a price. What is the price of liberty? Eternal vigilance, right? Have any of you ever read the Oregon Constitution? A couple, I see a couple of hands. If you can't define liberty, how can you defend it? If you can't define tyranny, how can you defeat it? If you don't know the rules, there was an interesting uh, uh, survey done in 1992 by the Constitutional Center, and in that survey, it was something like 88% of the people said that Constitution was important in their daily lives. And something like 70% of the people said that it was important for us to participate in government on a daily basis. Those things were important to our daily lives. In that same survey, 60% of the people didn't know there were three branches of government. And 40% of them couldn't name all three, and something like 30% of them couldn't even name one of them. When we don't know the rules, we're closing the only window we have through which we look to see if government's doing a good job. How can you hold somebody accountable if you don't even know the rules they're supposed to follow? How can you hold yourselves accountable as citizens if you don't even know the rules that you're supposed to follow? You can't. And that's what Jefferson is about. We need to form a state with constitutional republic, with integrity, with honorable principles. 
that we adhere to so that we can secure liberty for these children. That's the most important thing. Now, there are two questions I hear. What about the money? What are we going to do without all the welfare money that Salem gives you? What are we going to do without the welfare money that California gives us? I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to become responsible adults and learn to feed ourselves. Right? And we're also going to become honorable adults and we are going to learn to feed our neighbors that we know are in need. Because is the state in a better position to know what your neighbors need or are you? I mean, in this country, churches and community service organizations typically handle all of the charity. And you know what? They knew who needed it and they knew who, were, who was game in the system. The state of Utah has a very viable private welfare system. It's actually run by the church. And you go into the church and you talk to people who are church people because believe me, God has jurisdiction here, doesn't he? He has jurisdiction over morality, sociable behavior. That's what God has jurisdiction over. What do you have jurisdiction over? Your children, what they learn, what they eat, how they behave, what kind of productivity they grow up to have. That is your jurisdiction. What does civil government have jurisdiction over? Article 1, Section 8, making peace, making war, concluding treaties with foreign government, coining money and land taxes. That's it. It is not in there that it is their job to supply everybody with everything they think, want, whimper for, and tell your children what they should know and how they should be and who they should grow up to be. That's your jurisdiction. God's jurisdiction is over charity, welfare, morality, honor, integrity. Civil government has certain jurisdictions, Article 1, Section 8. In the state of Jefferson, those things will hold true because they're the things that built this country. So we'll have a private welfare system. We will have a part-time legislature. Why on earth would you want to pay guys 50,000 bucks a year to sit there and grind out 895 laws every single year, most of which make you into a criminal? I mean, you know, here's another principle of Constitution. And you can look at, read this document. It doesn't take very long. Constitution binds government. Everything in this Constitution is a negative right. Congress shall make no law. The right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Those are the negatives. There is no, there is no line in this book that says government can restrict you from speaking. Government can keep you from buying things. You are not allowed to go here, there, and everywhere. There's nothing in here about that. Constitution binds government, not people. That's the kind of constitution we want. We want a part-time legislature where every legislator gets one bill a year. Make it a good one, because that's all you get. If it fails, try again next year. <laughs> we want a constitution where districts are small enough so that you know you're a legislator. We want one for 20,000 and no more than that. And we'll do it like the state of New Hampshire. They have 3,700 representatives in the state of New Hampshire or something like that. You know how much a political campaign costs in New Hampshire? A thousand bucks. The guy pays his filing fee, puts gas in his car, and he knocks on 3,000 doors. And guess what? If he does a bad job, one of his neighbors gets together and says, I've had enough of that. I've got a thousand bucks. I'm going to run against him. You know how much it costs to run a state election campaign here in Oregon? It's probably closer to a million bucks. In California, it's probably closer to 10 million bucks. Who has that money? You or special interest groups and, big, and large corporations? Who runs politics? The money. We are going to suck the money out of the politics. We're not going to pay these guys. They will get a stipend and they will serve because it's the right thing to do. Now we will have some clause that if they leave their job to go serve, their job is guaranteed when they get back. We have to do that. We have to do the right thing. So that's what about the money? Okay, now I have some questions here somebody gave me. What about the debt? How are we going to deal with PERS? We have CalPERS in California that claims something like $2.1 trillion in unfunded liabilities. That is a debt ship headed to the bottom, folks. But here's the deal. We want to start on the best footing possible. We want to start with the truth, not the lie. And we have to tell the truth all the way along. No, you didn't have representation, but you weren't asleep when they were blowing that money, were you? So here's the honorable thing to do. 
Our debt will be apportioned by committees of separation once we gain statehood. Those committees will be elected by us and by you and by your county commission and, and California and Salem can pick theirs however they want to, you know, I don't care. And at that point, we'll have budget committees which will separate the assets and the debt. The California State's Attorney General, Camilla Harris, yes, she is a liar, but she's still our Attorney General. Her opinion is, and this is not my opinion, and I can show you where this was written, her opinion is, should we be successful in forming the state of Jefferson, all assets formerly belonging to the state of California that lie within the state of Jefferson will belong to us. So if you hear the argument, how are, you know, you're not going to get to keep that bridge or that prison or that, that state building, that's not true. You were state, you were citizens of Oregon when the separation occurred. You partially paid for those things. Those things will belong to you in the new state, and the committees of separation will, will argue that. Now, let's go to sovereignty, because this is very important. Once we have sovereignty, how do we get sovereignty? How much of the land in Oregon is owned by the feds? Like 50-something percent? 53. Why is that? Here, here's something that's very interesting. In the, in the Enabling Act that created the state of California, and created every single state since 1849, and I can show you these, I have Californias right here in this pile of junk somewhere, the sovereignty that we're granted by the United States of America when we became a state in 1850 was this. California becomes one of the free and independent states of the United States and is entitled to equal sovereignty, and here's the good part, with the original 13, the original states. Oregon has an Enabling Act that says the same thing. The Enabling Act, the Enabling Act sovereignty line was created with an Alabama case called Pollard Lessee versus Hagan. When Alabama became a state, the Fed said, you can become a state, but we want to keep the tide lands and we're going to keep the fishing rights because really that's where all the money is and you guys can keep the junk. And the Supreme Court said, no, fellas, that's not how it works. When Alabama becomes a state, its territory belongs to it. Its money belongs to it. Everything within its border belongs to the state. And further, the state of Alabama, Pollard, Lessee versus Hagen, remember that case, 1849, the state of Alabama will enter the United States with equal sovereignty to the original 13. How much BLM lands in Vermont? How much BLM land is in New York? How much BLM lands in Connecticut? How much BLM lands in Delaware? My arm's getting tired, so I'm going to quit. But you get the point. The federal government had possession of lands, and once again, there is another case, Bird Sale, or excuse me, Georgia versus Bird Sale, that confirms this. There's another case, Coyle versus Smith in Oklahoma, that confirms this. Uh, the United States wanted Oklahoma to move its state capital, and that was a condition upon which they placed statehood. The Supreme Court said, no, fellas, that is now it works. In fact, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson further said, why would anyone want to join this union on a second tier? What would be the point of that? Why would you want to be a state if you did not enjoy an equal status with the original colonies that had become states? Who would want to do that? Nobody. That's where the equal footing doctrine was really born with our founders, the people who wrote the contract we call Constitution. We have equality with the original 13 states, but we must express that sovereignty and interpose ourselves between the federal government and our people. How do we do that? Nullification. Uh, in Blackstone's Law, nullification is called the old doctrine where states can nullify unconstitutional federal documents, or federal doctrines, I'm sorry. That's state nullification. That is an accepted principle of law until 1928. Lots of states have done it. Sometimes you have to sue, sometimes you have to be a little more aggressive, but the point is state nullification is a very important policy, just as jury nullification is. Do you know a court, well, a judge will start screaming at an attorney if he talks about jury nullification. You know, jury nullification is codified in the Oregon State Constitution. You have the right to jury nullification here. We don't have that in California, which we did. But nullification is a very important principle because once again, the document and the product of the document 
never has power over the author of the document. And in Federalist 78, uh, James Mason's, or, or uh, yeah, James Mason said that. He said to admit otherwise is to admit that the servant has become greater than the master. And remember, people created government, not the other way around. Has the servant become the master? Is your creation more important than you? God created you. Are you more important than God? No. Will that ever be possible? No. Would you ever conceive of it? No. But government does. They want to replace God in the equation as the all-powerful being that tells you everything you need, everything you want, everything you should want. The state of Jefferson, we will attempt to stop that, and if we do our jobs, we can secure liberty for our posterity. Uh, I'll close now and answer your questions, but um, I've flown all over the world. I, I spent 43 years as a uh, pilot for a military contract airline. I've been to six wars with the United States government. I've been to every socialist pest hole there is. I've landed on the freeway in Kuwait, plank steel runways in Somalia, southern Sudan, Ouagadougou in Burkina Faso, Central African Republic, Rwanda. We had a French military contract in Rwanda when they were murdering each other. I have a couple of questions to ask you. Number one, do you trust a government that doesn't trust you? I don't know why I don't. I don't know why one would. Another thing, any government big enough to give you everything, it's big enough to take it all away. Hold on to the Constitution, my friends, and to the Republic for which it stands. For miracles do not tend to cluster, and what has happened once in 6,000 years is not likely to happen again. We have an opportunity here. You have an opportunity. We cannot and won't do this for you. If you choose to join Jefferson, we will help you. We will show up anytime you need us. We'll show you what worked and didn't work. We'll help you with paperwork, with process. With, we'll put our, lump you in with our attorneys. We will do everything humanly possible. But we are Californians. We only have the jurisdiction to petition the California legislature. You have the jurisdiction to peti petition your own. If you are accepting of what I have to say, and you believe that it's the truth, and you believe that it's possible, and believe me, anything is possible, and this country is living proof of that, then form a committee, uh, get a hold of Terry or Wynn or myself, let us know who you are, and we'll help you get started with this process. Here's the process. You gather signatures. You need thousands of them for this county. You need proof to your county commission that if they don't affirm this declaration, you will replace them, and you have the power to do that. If you can put the votes barring their participation, and we have counties where the governmental officials have their heads buried so far up their backsides, they need a plastic belly button to see where they're going. <laughs> and what we have done in those communities... <laughs> we have done in those communities is we've gathered signatures equal to the number of 51 percent of the number of people who voted in the last general election and then we have a declaration of by and for the people of this county and we go to your state house and we record it and start the article 4 process with or without them remember all power is inherent in the people it is their right to alter or abolish government anytime the public good requires it that's your jurisdiction and I'm going to leave you with one thought. The difference between constitutional republic and tyranny is easy. It's simple. Under any form of constitutional republic, you wake up in the morning secure in the knowledge that the rules yesterday are the same as they are today. They apply to everyone equally. And you're secure in the knowledge that you own the property you owned yesterday without worry, without fear that it'll be taken from you and that you can use that property to make a living for yourselves and your family. In fact, Benjamin Franklin said, unless property is secure, liberty cannot exist. In any form of tyrannical government, you wake up in the morning and you ask yourself a question. What is the government going to do to me today? What form of government do you live under now? And what form of government would you like to live under? Because you have the opportunity to change that. I'll just close by reading you the preamble to the Constitution of the State of Jefferson. There are times in the history of men when political discourse leads to a separation of two people. We, the people of the state of Jefferson, do not make this separation out of enmity, for in the case of enmity we hold none, toward any man, woman, race, or creed. 
We make this separation in the name of representation, the last barrier standing between the people and tyranny. And tyranny, however well-intentioned, is nonetheless repugnant. Our safety, our security concern us not where liberty is at risk. Liberty gives urgent voice to our demand for representation. Representation must reflect our needs, our history, our, our culture, and our moral imperative. These are the liberties the people of Jefferson hold most dear. The preservation of our natural inalienable rights compel us to establish the state of Jefferson. We the people direct our representatives now and forever that the intent and meaning of this Constitution shall always be adjudicated to the protection of the lives, liberty, and property of and for the people of the state of Jefferson. With this state constitution, it is our humble prayer to Almighty God to secure liberty for our posterity. Thank you very much. Signatures and all that, because we do have some that need a lot of pushing and nudging. 
in Josephine County. So uh, what is the time frame in that? I guess I wasn't paying attention. Oh, okay, the beauty of that is for you guys in Oregon, there is no time frame because we're going to push ahead. So we may well have created a state before you get your statements, but in one respect, it's easier in the sense that if we're successful in creating the state, it will be easier for you to join our state than it will be to concurrently create a state out of two adjoining states. That's that's so so. There's no time limit. Just go as fast as you can because you want liberty. So even with that, just start right now. Yeah, I mean we've been at this two we've been okay. at this two and a half years. Okay. If it takes you five years, it takes you five years. What is it? Uh, Judy is going to be one of the people on the committee, right? Hey, there you go. Yeah. All right, Judy. Careful when you ask a question up here. Who's next? Good question. Good question. So, uh, uh, you know, come on over here. Mine is on property uh, because minors have an inherent property right, but we're treating that we don't. That, uh, we, they require so much stuff for us to go through. And when you were talking about depriving somebody of property, but how can they deprive your property and put you in jail? Well, private property in the state of Jefferson will actually be private property. And here's the thing this is what the courts were created for. If you utilize your private property and you do a poor job of that, you're the one that suffers for it. Our problem is a commons problem. When everyone's private property essentially is placed, placed under the same basket of people who supervise it, greed and corruption enter into the deal and everybody loses. So if you are irresponsible with your private property so that it infringes on your neighbor's rights, that's what the courts are for. And they'll determine, not the government. So your private property is going to belong to you, and if you want to burn your house down, burn it down. As long as you don't set your neighbor's house on fire. Well, that, that's what I was... That this state is going to be about... This state is about personal responsibility. That's what it is, folks. Personal responsibility. you got to stand up for your actions and be accountable for them, period. Yes, sir. Hi, how are you doing? My name is Ron Smith. I'm running for County Commissioner in Josephine County, position number three. Well, God bless you. And I believe in the, uh, the, the, the ideal of the state of Jefferson. We definitely not represented from Salem or Sacramento. Thank you very much. And we aim, we aim to fix that. So, what's your name again? Yeah, you you all know who to vote for if you want Jefferson. My family homesteaded to Josephine County over 100 years ago. I'm a native born Oregonian. Welcome to the club. Yeah, and, 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 and part of the city too. Well, thank you for joining. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Appreciate your service. You talked about uh, county representation in the state legislature as opposed to one man, one vote, which is essentially what we've got now. How does that square with the 17th Amendment? Well, it squares because it is still going to be one man, one vote, but you will be voting for your representative in your county. I mean, we're not, we're not trying to change one man, one vote. Everyone will have a vote. That vote will have equal weight for the representative you're voting for. Prior to the 17th Amendment, though, the state was represented yes. in the federal. Yeah, but we're not talking about federal positions now. We're talking about state positions. So your county... Uh, will elect a state senator. You will have one man, one vote within your county for that state senator. Your county will elect at least one state assembly person. You will have one man, one vote within your county for that state assembly person. Here's the difference. When your county needs something, you don't need a lobbyist. You call your senator on the phone and say, hey, Joe or Mary, get on this if you want to hang on to your job. Within the state, how about within the relationship the, with the federal with the federal government? government the state of Jefferson will have two, two United States Senators, and probably because of our population, we will have either one or two representatives in Congress, the same as any other state. In other words, we're not trying to throw the baby out with the bathwater. All we want is representation. But guess what we can accomplish? If we can accomplish a change in the representative model in the state of Jefferson, guess what's going to happen after that? Other states are going to want it because the businesses that are fleeing California and fleeing Oregon for Texas, all they're gonna to have to do is jump in the U-Haul and drive two hours down the road and settle in Jefferson. Other states will see an ec economic and social model that succeeds on liberty, and guess what they might do? Change their model to match ours, and at some point, we'll have enough horsepower to turn to the federal government and demand constitutional behavior. That'd be nice. Amen, brother. <laughs> Talked about 
taxes, uh, property taxes. When a person has to pay property taxes, they don't really own their property. Okay, you know, I'm kind of glad you asked that because as a proponent of Jefferson, this is my personal, this is my personal agenda. Okay, this is what I want myself. I'm not the king of Jefferson. I don't know if this will happen, but this is what I want. I think at some point in your life, there should be a period at the end of the sentence. I don't care what age it is. I don't care what criteria we place it on. But at some point, the state should to a citizen and say, thank you for your service and your money. You're done. Go live your life. That stuff is yours, and you never have to pay a dollar tax for the about the property taxes for a period of time and yeah. at a certain point. What if, why not just do, a, you know, there's, there's a lot of things in the finance world today where you could change things around. You can have a sales tax with a percentage yeah. of that going into an annuity. Yeah, which is fine. Nobody I, would have to pay I, I don't disagree with anything you've said and, and fortunately for me, thank God, I'm not a financier. So we depend on people who have ideas like that. Please submit your ideas because if those things can turn what we imagine into an even better constitutional republic, we want it. So please write that down and submit it. I like the idea. What about, what about uh, the uh, environmental protection agency kinds of things? What would the state of Jefferson do with that? Uh, in other words, state or federal EPA? EPA they won't yeah. exist in the state of Jefferson. Okay. So, here in, in the city of Grants Pass, I was going to go build a house for profit. Okay. I want twelve thousand dollars for an hour building permit. Yeah, and and those things. And here's the deal: the state of Jefferson will do a lot of things. Here's some things it won't do. It will not correct bad behavior on the part of your county commission. That's up to you. If you don't like the way those people behave, if you don't like your permits and your tax structure within this county, elect better people. The state of Jefferson will provide an environment where your county can have some sovereignty and some say and interpose against state intrusion into your life and our state will have the backbone to respect that and our state will have the backbone to keep the feds out to the highest degree we possibly can. But it will not fix the building inspector in Josephine County. That's up to y'all to do. Elect better people. Yeah, in a lot of the questions here, that stuff will get done by you because this is yours. You're we the people. Right. And so you will understand what you need and what your needs are in particular issues like that. Uh, it's, uh, my question is uh, several, several fold. One is relating to taxes. You said there would be kind of a state escrow account in terms of federal income tax. Uh, where will the FICA tax fit into that? And where will like uh, federal highway fuel taxes fit? And you had said that it wasn't just for the state or the government to take from one and give to another. Well, a uh, prime example of that is uh, FICA, which is for Social Security. That's a tax, uh, and it's taxed on one group of people and given to another group of people. So how will that be handled in the context okay, of the now, state? I, I would like to say that I have an answer to every bit of minutiae that could come up in a new state, and I've just got to be truthful with you, I don't. But we will have a state's constitutional convention where every county will have a say in how those affairs are handled. I'm not the king of Jefferson. I, have, I imagine how I would build a state if I were totally in charge, but I'm not. You people have to have a say, too. I, I'm not for or against Social Security, to tell you the truth. I don't even know enough about it. I am for liberty. If we want to have some structure where FICA is handled differently, I'm not opposed to that, provided the people of the state of Jefferson want that. I mean, I'm not opposed to anything that the people of the state of Jefferson want to do to secure liberty. I don't know what all of those things are, so I don't know about FICA, FUDA, and, and all the rest of it, Medicare, Medi-Cal. We can handle those things, though. Here's the deal. We're not stupid people. I imagine if you examine the educational background of just the people in this room, we have plenty of talent to figure that stuff out. The last thing on earth I want is oppression. I want liberty. But I, I imagine we got plenty of brain power to figure those things out so that they're not only equitable, they're also constitutional. And I'll just have to leave it at that because I don't know the answer that you're looking for. Uh, just one other, no, we have a tool question. 
<laughs> will the state of Jefferson be incorporated? We will not be a corporation. We will be a constitutional republic. However, within that, as in Article 11, Section 1 of the California Constitution, and here's where interposition and sovereignty and nullification are very important. Each county will be a legal subdivision of the state so that the state cannot come in and say, you know, you people just aren't acting right. We're going to roll this county in with Jackson County because those county commissioners know how to act right with our money. We won't be able to do those things. So the state itself is not going to be a corporation. No, it will be a constitutional republic with common law. Good. Okay, we can take one more question. Hey, oh, Sheriff. Hill. How are you? Hey, Sheriff. Yeah. Constitutional sheriff. I mean, I've been with him in Mendocino County when he was down there speaking to folks about liberty and about the Constitution, and he drove all the way back from Mendocino County because he had to cover a night shift, and that was his responsibility. Give this man a hand. I just asked a question that I was wondering, being that you've got the federal level, the state, city, county, all incorporated, how are we going to coexist within that environment? Um, and they can just basically answer it. So, yeah. But that's, that's a real critical issue that has to be overcome. Yes, it, it is, because it is that corporate structure that opens a lot of bad doors. <laughs> using, using the concept that you put forth, will it be Article 4 judges? Three three. constitutional judges. Article yes, three. there will have to be. So you, you know, you have three. In three. other words, yeah, Article Three judges. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And they will not have the authority to alter the document which created them. In other words, what the court has the authority to do under the Kentucky and the Virginia resolutions and declaration is, if they find a piece of bad legislation that they feel is extra or unconstitutional, they send it back to the legislature, and the legislature alters that legislation so that it is constitutional. And Sheriff, if you have any thoughts about that stuff, by gosh, don't keep them a secret, okay? <laughs> We'll be hanging around for a little bit more if somebody has some one-on-one some -on -one things they want to ask Mark, and we'll be around for about another 20, 25 minutes. Remember, so. folks, liberty is everything. Without liberty, you're not going to be allowed to keep the money. And without liberty, you're not going to be allowed to keep the property. Liberty first, liberty always. Uh, well, one second here. Before, this, what's, your, what's your name? Jerry. Jerry. This is what I mean about somebody stepping up. She said, well, can we kind of get on one side of the room with the Jackson County folks, maybe on the other side of the room with the Josephine County folks, and talk about how we're going to get something done? That's the kind of people, Jerry, give her a hand. Yeah. yeah. Because that's where you get stuff done. You get stuff done by doing it. You don't get stuff done by going home and watching the football game and eating ice cream. You get, you get it done by getting it done. So, yeah, it's a great idea. In fact, Jerry, here's a mic you can divide it up. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Uh, Douglas County back by the t-shirts and Josephine County over here to the left.